All right, one to the two, two to the three, in the place to be. Welcome to the Impact Lounge, Impact Wrestling Review. I am your host, BQ, and I'm joined today by both Ro the Great, who you have heard on several podcasts with me, and Adam, who you may have heard represent the Impact Lounge on the Impact Wrestling conference calls. Yes, we have rebranded from the King of the Mound podcast of the Impact Lounge because it's laid back, we're kicking it, and we're talking Impact Wrestling. If you're listening on YouTube, Please subscribe so we can hit the next goal of 2,000 followers. If you prefer listening to the review in a streaming format, you can check us out on Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and hopefully by the time you are hearing this on Google Play. Just look up the Impact Lounge or King of the Mountain podcast and it will pop up. Make sure to check out my homies The Heel Cast as well as Andre Cornbeal for more Impact Wrestling coverage. And tonight I will be conducting an interview with William Weeks who was an enhancement talent that you may have seen on Impact this year. He took on Trevor Lee, Congo Kong, and uh, one other guy that I don't quite remember. This Impact review comes to you courtesy of Draft. If you're a daily fantasy sports player and enjoy playing for money, head over to playdraft.com BQ, and they will match your first deposit. Let's get into Victory Road 2017. First of all, Ro, give me your uh, general thoughts on the show. Um, compared to, cause I know this was supposed to be more of, you know, a pay-per-view like feel, um, compared to the last, uh, two shows to last two episodes of impact. Um, I thought, I thought it was, uh, laid out well, the card, you know, from top to bottom was uh, really good. Adam, how was victory road for you? Yeah, it's the same really. I thought, uh, good matches, uh, logical run through, you know, everything on the card was placed about right and, uh, yeah, progressed things nicely. I enjoy the show overall. Um, the The crowd for this whole set of tapings has been a lot better than what we've seen in the uh, in the past. However, this day of tapings was the uh, day of SummerSlam, so it was a little smaller than what we have been seeing the other days. It had a little less energy too, so I kind of would have liked Victory Road to be um, in front of one of those other crowds. But it seemed like that was probably how they were. You know, I'm just speculating here. That's probably how they were promoting it to the crowd. Um, on that day, hey, it's our Victory Road show because they knew they had some competition that day and people had other options of uh, what they could uh, be watching. Overall, uh, fairly solid. We uh, kick off with the X Division title match, so I don't think that's a huge surprise. They've been kicking off with the X Division matches for the most part and uh, been doing a very good job of just very little talking at the beginning with the exception of last week with uh, KM and Johnny Impact. And... Um, Trevor Lee defends his title against P.D. Williams. Maybe a little bit random uh, of an opponent at this time. Um, I know that he was involved with the whole Sanjay angle and everything. But, uh, Adam, what do you think about the uh, X Division title match? Yeah, it's good. I, I mean, I said the last time I was on the show that uh, I, I really like Trevor Lee. Uh, I think he's a, a great character. He's also very good at uh, interacting with the crowd and getting them uh, you know, up on their feet, which I, I don't want to say it's a... A curtain jerker match, you know, being the opening one, but at the same time, you know, uh, it's early in the evening, trying to get the crowd riled up. I think he's excellent. P.T. Williams, obviously, long time, long time uh, member of the roster, on and off. But uh, yeah, I, I just, I thought the match technically was very good, but I just love Trevor Lee, and I think it was absolutely the right decision to keep it on him. Uh, I think he's a, uh, he's someone who should run with it for a while, and and almost have that honky tonk man kind of run where he holds it for a long time, but he wins it by the scrape of his teeth, by cheating, by doing everything he can to keep hold of it, as opposed to any real reason, you know, to wrestling ability. I kind of like him in that role. Ro, um, what were you thinking about this title match? Was it what you expected that it would be? Um, outside of the fact, and I know we had discussed this um, last pod, um, you know, I just think it's silly. Uh, Pete Williams got a title shot before Sanjay, you know, the whole rematch thing. But outside of that... Um, Nice back and forth match. I mean, there was times where you know I really thought uh, P. Williams had a chance to become the new X Division champion, and I think uh, matches like this and opponents like uh, uh, such as like P. D. Williams, it's only going to help Trevor Lee's reign because you know his past couple of reigns were kind of lackluster. So for him to be facing you know whether it's former X Division champions or you know top level contenders, it's really going to do him wonders for this reign to make it uh, you know better than the last two. So overall with Victory Road, a couple of the things that were negatives to me was that we kind of start we kind of saw certain 
um, angles done multiple times. So uh, Conley, he, you know, he got kicked out. Um, later, Adonis got kicked out. We saw multiple chair, sh- uh, not chair shots, but title shots to the head. So there was a there was kind of a well that they kind of kept going back to a little bit, which um, I didn't t- absolutely care for. But this match was very enjoyable. I thought Trevor Lee slowed it down a couple times, um, where, where I was I, I kind of wanted a little bit more action. But um, he really sold that Canadian destroyer, <laughs> and uh, I actually thought. I actually did think the match was over there. I mean, I don't read the spoilers, so I didn't, you know, I didn't know what titles would change hands, if any. But I actually did think it was over once he hit the move, and then he started rolling him over so slowly. And I saw the referee in position to be dragged out of the ring by Conley, and um, that was exactly what happened. It looks like Trevor Lee is going with that double stomp as a finisher right now, which um, I like a lot better than that fisherman. Uh, I think it's called fisherman suplex. Um, kind of like picks him up for the perfect plex, kind of a bang, uh, brain buster. So yeah, Trevor Lee retains. I, I tweeted out that I was really happy to see Caleb Conley on TV in a consistent basis right now because he's someone that could, you know, definitely be on the chopping block if, uh, you know, given the way he was booked up to this point. But I think he's been a pretty good soldier so far after taking so long to debut, you know, doing everything as uh, suicide and now um, pairing up with Trevor Lee. So they announced this a little bit later in the show. I'm going to get your thoughts first, Ro. Were you were you kind of caught off guard when it announced a six-man tag for next week, which was um, Sanjay PD and Matt Seidel against Trevor Lee, Caleb Conley, and Andrew Everett? Yeah, because it, it seems like, you know, like you said, going back to the well, you know, they just kind of just threw, a, you know, a match together. I mean, if they would have said, you know, even if they would have done Sanjay PD versus uh, Trevor Lee and Conley, you know, it makes sense. You know, all four of these guys have, you know, been feuding. But you throw Everett in, doesn't Everett have issues with, you know, Lee? Yeah. And then Seidel, you know, we haven't seen him since um, his match with uh, Eli Drake. So it was just, you know, it's a bit random. It's just kind of, you know, something they've, you know, done in the past where they just throw guys together. You got anything, uh, Adam, on that? Yeah, I totally agree with Ro there that, uh, you know, they could have done that so much better. They could even, I know we're talking about going to the well, but, you know, this would have worked much better if they'd have said, okay, you know, you can even up the score, go and find yourself two teammates and then, he brings back Everett, you know, and says, well, you know, you've had problems in the past and he brings back uh, Sanjay from, from wherever he's been, you know. And that's the thing that I said on the last show that, that I have problems with is sometimes they just drop storylines. And I know you guys have been talking about it the last few weeks about, you know, Moose and EC3 are suddenly friends out of the blue. Uh, you know, there's no uh, continuation of that storyline. It's the same with this. Suddenly you got six wrestlers thrown together in a match for no real reason other than, they're on the roster <laughs> let's get them on and build towards uh bank of glory right when they first uh showed the match graphic i thought it was a uh six-way match and i was like you know as random that is i can get it but then i was like oh that's a six-man tag what the hell is ever doing in there so at least we're getting to see andrew everett again and maybe this um opens the door to building up towards him getting a title shot but i'm, I'm really excited to see uh next week uh, the demeanor of Andrew Everett when he's out there. So um, then we, uh, after the match, go to the LAX clubhouse and uh, Diamante call them pussies. <laughs> she's got a foul mouth on her. That's for sure. I'm, I'm, I think we're all patiently waiting until she's cleared and she can get back in the ring uh, because she's, she's an extremely talented gal. After this was the match that I think, uh, most people seem to be really excited about when it was the uh, six knockout tag match, Gail Kim, Rosemary, and Ali versus Taya, Valkyrie, Taryn Terrell, and the knockouts champion, Sienna. Adam, we'll go to you uh, first again on this one. I want to know um, how you felt about the match and, you know, because we haven't been very getting very good knockout matches lately. Um, the, the knockout creative has been really good, but we've been getting very quick matches and you know was this was this what you were hoping it was going to be or did you think it was they held back a little no I, I thought the match was actually very good and there was certain things in it which i really liked in the way that the heels interacted especially the bit where uh uh tire uh, was holding back for the tag i think it was it gail kim trying to make the tag and she kept on 
letting her put her hand out and then dragging it back. I, I like things like that. And I like the, the hill aspect. But my biggest problem at the moment is that the champion is not being treated like the champion in the division. And even in the way this match was booked, Sienna wasn't really, she was like an afterthought on the heel side um, compared to, to, to Valkyrie and uh, Valkyrie and, sorry, and um, Taryn Terrell. You know, it seems like she's got the weakest story of all the knockouts at the moment, and she's the champ. And, uh, it frustrates me because I'm, I'm a huge Sienna fan. I like all the knockouts. I think they're all very good. But I just think that they're getting lost in the mix at the moment because they've only got real time for one story each week. They're getting lost in the mix. But as a match, I thought it was very good. I quite liked it. Ro, thoughts on the knockouts? Um, You know, before I get into it, I want to piggyback off of what uh, Adam you know, was uh, alluding to as far as with Sienna. You know, I noticed the same thing, too. I think this is a scenario where you got, you know, women within the division who are feuding with one another and no one's really feuding with the champion. And obviously everyone's, you know, main goal is to, you know, compete for the knockouts championship. So they probably need to find her a contender. But as far as the match goes, um, the thing that stood out to me the most is I felt like Taya, you know, they made Taya look real strong, except exception to when she was in the ring with Gail, because, you know, we all know Gail <laughs> conquers all. But uh, um, overall, it was great, and I'm interested to see the direction that they go in, you know, leading up to Bound for Glory, because you can either do a multi-woman match for the Knockouts Championship, or you could do single matches with, you know, dare I say, you know, Taya versus Rosemary, Gail versus Taryn, and then, I mean, maybe you have Ali versus Sienna for the Knockouts Championship. But uh, yeah, overall, uh, I liked what these women did. They produced. I think they're building towards a multi-woman match at Bound for Glory. There, there's too many too many women in the mix. And as you guys said, and I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't even think about that. But you're right, Sienna it, it is kind of floating with this whole storyline. Um, the, only, the only thing that makes her stand out is that she doesn't quite like Taya and Taryn. But she's kind of hanging out with them anyway. But that's really something very minor. I don't know what the hell Gail Kim is wearing. Um it was like Aaron Rex dressed her or something. You know, wearing that <laughs> skin colored outfit. It just um uh, one thing I noticed really before the match, I mean these most of these women have really nice entrances, good entrance music. Like it was it was uh it was kind of enjoyable enjoyable for me to watch them all come down. I thought uh Rosemary in the first couple of seconds of the match looked a little weak. Um and, and I had been kind of saying that the last couple of weeks is that she's just been very vulnerable out there. I mean she gets in there, you know, she'll do a rundown and, and start getting beat down or a run in, I should say, start getting beat down. So I feel like Rosemary hasn't been looking too strong lately, and I hope that changes. Uh, I think my only real issue with this match, and it was mainly with Taya, was that there was just a lot of the moves were really telegraphed. You know, you, you it's like they're sticking the arm out or they're running at their opponent a certain way where you kind of knew what was coming. So I think it took a little while to get locked in. I like the Terran kind of coward gimmick, if you will, where, you know, she goes in the, oddly enough, she goes in the ring happy to wrestle Rosemary and then uh, tags out and Gail comes in and she uh, tags right back out. Uh, but, you know, this match did get some time. It got nine and a half minutes. And, uh, you know, we, the last couple of weeks, we just been seeing squash matches with Taya and, you know, they kind of made the comment, oh, Taya's beat everyone they've thrown at him, like, thrown at her. Taya could have beat Ava Story and um, Amber Nova in a handicap match. Let's be freaking real. So, you know, it, it was good to actually see Taya compete a little bit. And, you know, Ali is, is uh, I've been po uh, pointing this out. She's now kind of in a role where she can wrestle. Yeah, maybe she's still a little bit silly, but, you know, she's not in the learning to wrestle stage anymore as, as people try to say that she is. So um, I predicted Sienna was going to pin Allie for the win. And she did with a textbook schoolgirl roll up and gets the win. So uh, what, what do you think? So sorry to interrupt BQ. What do you think about the need for putting feet on the rope on this one? Because to me, it just didn't seem like I was needed. And I... You know why I didn't have a problem with it was because the last time the knockouts had a tag team match, I think it was a, uh, it might have been Taryn and Sienna against Allie and, and Gail. It, it ended up with um, Sienna rolling up Allie in a really anticlimactic finish. And when I saw, when she kind of went for the roll up here, the first thing I thought was, oh my God, they're, they're 
they're going to do the same exact finish. So just the fact that she put her feet up, it gave us a different element. So that's why I was kind of cool with it. You got anything else, Ro, on it? Um, no, I was fine with that. Um, as far as her using the feet on the ropes, um, I the one thing I've noticed with Impact, um, the heels actually try to be heels. They want you to boo them. They're not trying to be cool heels. So any dirty tactics, you know, they're gonna do, you know, display those dirty tactics because they want, you know, the fans to boo. So I'm I'm fine with it. Any final thoughts on that, Adam? Yeah, just, just, I was going to go back to something you mentioned, actually, the, the entrances. Um, I think that's one thing that they're doing very well with, with the, the knockouts that they brought in and a lot of the other stars that they're bringing in. But uh, it was something that Billy Corgan talked about on the Common Squires with, uh, when he joined the company. He was talking about he wants to bring theatrics back, and it's something they've done very well. And it's more noticeable, certainly, with the knockout entrances this week. But I, I like it when, when they're made to look like stars as opposed to just a run-in, you know, for with some generic music. So it's great. Who did you say wanted to bring the theatrics back? It, it was Billy Corgan. It, he was the one who mentioned oh. it. He was talking about New Japan. And I think that's maybe from his showbiz background. But he, I remember when he came into the company, he said that uh, one of the things that he wants to bring to, as it was TNA then, was to, to bring back more of a show element and, and, and give all these characters, you know, something more than just some generic rock music and coming down the ramp. Uh, and it's something that's been very noticeable from from EC3 all the way up to to, to Tyre now coming in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we get an Impact um, Johnny Impact um, promo, but before that, we got an Eli Drake promo, which was excellent. You know, these every week he's been kind of doing those little uh, promos at some point of the show, and they're always really good. <laughs> you know, he said, "Take a look in these baby blue eyes, but don't get lost in them." Um, so he, he did a great job. Johnny Impact had had one with uh, a little sit down with um, um, I didn't call her McKenna McKenny uh, McKenzie and um, man Johnny Impact I I feel like his promo skills are a little overrated. Adam, do you? I mean, are are you? What do you think about? I mean, I don't know. Just when he speaks, it's I don't, I I can't even put it into words. To be honest, I remember back in the days, like his heel stuff was so good, and just him speaking as a babyface just is a little corny to me. Oh, absolutely, and you know, I, as we all do, I read a lot online, and I don't think anyone <laughs> overrates him on his promo skills that I've seen anyway. Uh, but he reminds me almost like Keanu Reeves, as in laid back and, and not very good at acting, that kind of tough guy, and. It all seems very scripted with him. It doesn't seem natural, whereas Eli Drake is just a natural charisma to him. Yeah, the whole slam town thing to me is not... That doesn't catch on with me at all. Maybe it will one day. You got any thoughts, Ro, on Johnny Impact's promo skills? Yeah, um, I kind of agree with you guys. And the one, the one thing that kind of stood out to me and what's been standing out to me with him, I kind of feel more so his heel work in the past. Like, I, I feel like he's one of these guys that he's better served to be a heel. I feel like as a face thus far, like, his promos kind of feel forced in a sense. Like, he, he can get the crowd engaged, which is good. But it's just like when he's having interactions with Eli Drake, I mean, Eli Drake will, you know, come at him with some stuff where it's like, oh, dang, you know, versus, you know, uh, uh, Impact will say to himself, like, yeah, slam town, baby, or you know, it just doesn't doesn't flow well. Then we move into uh, James Storm. He comes down to the ring, and it's it's good to start seeing James Storm on TV again. You know, they did the whole concussion gimmick. Uh, kind of, I don't want to say they dropped it, but they have kind of ignored it. Other than you know him and EC3 not getting along very well, so. He's uh, talking about the AAA guys. He gets the, he, and James Storm's always been able to get a crowd reaction, which I really appreciate from him. He uh, gets the crowd standing up and uh, doing the GFW chant. Um, <laughs> and as much as I appreciated it, at the same time, it was almost hard to listen to because we know they're not really global force anymore. And uh, the more that I start saying Impact Wrestling now and seeing Impact Wrestling, I kind of don't want to go back to global force wrestling. It would be a PR nightmare if they did, but um, I I'm getting pretty comfortable with just Impact again. So, And uh, 
the triple a music comes down uh plays i don't know if it's called the, tri- the triple a music necessarily but uh it plays and tejano comes down who uh i've stated as i'm not a major fan of but uh he comes down i figured it was going to be all three guys and um there's the the promo was pretty decent here you know uh some of some of the uh um some of the digs were a little a uh, little played out you know with the taco bell and the mexicans and and all that you know it, a little standard uh pro wrestling stuff when you're talking to a uh, mexican competitor um but no it, not bad phantasma comes comes down and uh we're actually hearing phantasma speak a little bit more now and uh you know, he has always said he speaks perfect English, um, you know, because some people asked him on social media. Now he's like, yeah, because he's always t- tweeting in Spanish, but he's like, no, I, I speak perfect English. Came down, they jump him. First thought in my head is when they're beating his ass. And first Storm was getting the upper hand on Tejano by himself. But as they're beating him, I'm like, where the hell is Eddie Edwards here? Like, they're, they're kind of acting like uh, there's nobody to save James Storm. Eddie Edwards is obviously part of this, so... The fact that he didn't uh, come down. But um, one thing I found really, really funny was when Phantasma told everyone to stand up and start chanting AAA. You know, I, I just found that I just found that hilarious because not a single person stood up, not a single person chanted. So it was <laughs> kind of like the heel aspect of what he tried to do worked. And then at the very end, he started chanting AAA and they were doing Taco Bell at the same cadence. So I actually found that really good but uh ec3 comes down and and i've stated in the past ec3 when he does run-ins he tends to walk down to the ring so i was happy to see him run down uh get fired up whip some ass and uh they're built they're building this feud here there was a handshake in the middle of the ring after it looked like he wasn't going to Ro, we'll, we'll go to you first on this one thoughts on this segment and um do you think they're going back to the ec3 uh baby face um, first, I want to address the same thing which you were stating um, when he when James Storm came out and was leading the crowd to the GFW chants. I kind of just like uh, shook my head a little bit only because like this is the downside of uh, when they do the long tapings when they have things that go on and um, you know there's significant changes within the company. You know, unfortunately, you know they've taped so far in advance where the changes are. You know, it, it looks outdated. So, but no, I, I liked it. I really like um, how they're showcasing Phantasma, and they gave him, you know, opportunity to go on the mic. I think out of all the people, um, whether it's AAA or Noah, I feel like they'll do something significant with Phantasma. Um, with EC3, it seems like. I mean, just the vibe I'm getting, I don't know if you guys agree or not. It seems like they're turning him face without kind of making it clear. You know, how, like mm-hmm. sometimes when someone does a turn, you know, they'll go and uh, attack a heel or something of that sort. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I, I'm one of the people who thought that his uh, first baby face run, the only thing that doomed it was him not having really a heel counterpart. But, you know, he has that now, you know, with Eli Drake. Thoughts on uh, on this one, Adam? Okay, a, a couple of thoughts on this one, if, if you don't mind. Uh, first things first, the promo by, by Storm. Uh, there, there was a glimmer of hope in the, at the beginning that he was going to do something different to what he eventually ended up doing, which was he said, it doesn't matter what color or race you are, we're all one person, people, blah, blah, blah. And it made out like, this is not going to be a stereotypical let's slate the other race, and then he calls him Taco Bell, or whatever it was, a Chihuahua. <laughs> and I just thought, within 30 seconds, he went from something really interesting to, yeah, we're back to what we were expecting it to be. So that was a bit of a shame. But anyway, I, I still think that the Storm's one of the best promo guys on the roster. He's very good at getting the crowd riled up, and I really like him. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was good. The, the, the problem I have with, not Storm, but more EC3 being part of this, is that this is obviously building to bang for glory at some point. So it looks like EC3 is either going to lose the title before then, or he's not going to defend it at bang for glory, which is a real shame. Um, so I, I'm just curious as to where it's going to go with, with the title on this, uh, on the Grand Championship title. So that's, that's one thing. But And the other thing is, is that I don't really see any mystery over this bout at bang for glory when it eventually happens. Is that can we see anything other than a Storm EC3 Eddie Edwards win? I, I, I just can't see it at all at this point. Uh, so, so 
I like the segment. I like what they're doing with it. But the payoff just feels like it's already written in the stars. You know, it doesn't feel like anything's going to change. It, it's all going to go the way we know it's going to go. I think EC3 is still the champion because he's traveling with the Impact uh, Grand Championship at the moment. So they're obviously building towards a three-on-three three bound for glory. I mean, I think that's pretty clear, which uh, I'd have some interest in because I, I love Storm. I love EC3. I love Eddie Edwards. I mean, they're in my top five or six favorite wrestlers in the company. So uh, I like where they're going with it. Uh, I do like Phantasma a lot. Um, don't don't know enough about Pagano at this point, and as I've stated about Tejano, not a not a major fan, but... um. Storm walks in and talks to Jim Cornette, and him and EC3 demand a match. Cornette said, I thought you guys hated each other, and very Partridge family-like at the same time. They're like, we do, and uh, added a bit of humor to it. I thought it was funny, but at least they addressed it this time. It wasn't like when um, Moose and EC3, as we've stayed a couple times, were around each other, seemed to get along just fine. You know, it was um, it, it was good that they're actually addressing the dynamic that these guys don't necessarily like each other, but they have common enemies. So next week we're getting James Storm and EC3 versus Tejano and Phantasma. So we'll see where the uh, storyline goes from there. We get another installment of Global Forged. I was a little confused with what they were doing here, and I don't know if either, either of you guys uh, understood it differently, but it almost sounded like they were... Uh, showing us the the very beginning of it when they were like calling the competitors to let them know they're going to be part of it because at first it looked like they were announcing the winners kind of um mm. because I, I believe i don't quite remember i think there's going to be three winners i think one is supposed to wrestle in noah and the other two are uh going to be in the impact developmental system that's what i i think i understood I don't, you, either of you guys like understand what they were doing here so rogue do you mind if i jump in here yeah um, go ahead just, just before we start on that global forge just going back to the jim Cornette thing so i, I don't want to get too far ahead before we i forgot about it i love Cornette in uh impact i think he's been brilliant and that segment where they both said yeah we do hate each other i thought was was, was gold i really did I, and i love stuff like that so you know major props to, to what they're doing and i just hope that somehow they find a way to keep Cornette on. I know they're saying that he's not going to be part of it going forward, but I f hope some way that he does because he's the best authority figure that they've had on impact as long as I can remember. I can't remember that uh, 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 an authority figure I've enjoyed. So hopefully he does stay around. But going back to the Global Forge stuff, yeah, the way I saw it was it felt like they were announcing the winners, as you said, but then maybe these are just the guys going through to the first round proper and they're going to have another similar sort of couple of episodes where there's another group of people that go through to the next round that's that's the way i kind of read into it same thing like what adam was uh alluding to i uh thought it was uh, more of a situation where you know we seen i want to say last week where they were showing uh the different participants uh trying out and then it looks like from those participants they selected three finalists and then these are the three that they're going to move forward with in the process yeah, I, I guess that's what it is. It, it just wasn't clear to me. Um, you know, going back to EC3 for a second, he, he sent this tweet out maybe two or three weeks ago that said, um, w which which wrestler has the worst Twitter account? Who's the worst uh, wrestler Twitter account to follow or whatever? And uh, I responded to it and I said Mike Bennett, and he DM'd me with a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> so. I would have said after this week it would be Martin Gennetti. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> what happened? What's going on with him? I, well, he's claimed that his account's got hacked, but he made inappropriate comments about his daughter, which turns out is not his real biological daughter. But yeah, it, I would say that's the worst one to follow. Right? At the <laughs> I, I don't know if that's uh, if it is hacked or whether it's that uh, he's had a few too many of uh, of uh, Hulk Hogan's vitamins at the time and didn't know what he was saying. Yeah, he, he he's always been kind of a mess. Um, but moving along, the tag team title match, LAX versus OVE. OVE, to me, I, I enjoy him in the fact that just in the ring, they do some really, really different stuff. And uh, I can always appreciate that. And that's what I, that's why I'm so connected to Reno Scum is because I just think they do so much innovative stuff. And I always, I can always appreciate that. 
uh, what I've said the last few weeks about OBE is just the, the promo skills and everything are just um, are not there yet. And th this whole feud, um, it, it's been okay, but and the match was um, fairly enjoyable. But what I, I, I was, I can hardly even remember the match because I was like flabbergasted at the finish. I um, wasn't expecting that at all. I wasn't expecting them to drop the titles and it was so anti the move that he did that DDT was badass, but it was very anticlimactic um, as far as j just them winning. And I had hit pause after he hit that because I don't know if one of my kids was talking to me or something. And you know, the ref had counted one, two, and then I hit pause and the ref's <laughs> hand was on the ground. I was like, no, that I was like, this is going to be one of those, like he gets the shoulder up. So then I rewinded about 10 seconds and hit pause and they sure as hell won the titles. Um, I'll go to you first row on this one. Did you see this coming? And uh, what do you think about the match and the outcome? Um, I didn't see it coming. I know we when we reviewed, I just went out on a limb and I thought they'd pull off the upset. But overall, the match, it was fine. Um, I just think this is a product of, you know, both teams not really having opponents to work with as dominant as LAX has been, I mean, what's next for them? So I think this gives them something to do in the sense of uh, chasing after, you know, the tag team titles now versus, you know, just, you know, they you know run-ins or whatever of that nature. I do fear, though, that unfortunately OV's run is going to be a short run, short one, but it's something new and something fresh. I'm, I was fine with it, the title change. I, I haven't been back on the show since OV debuted and i know when i was last on you were talking about they're coming next week and that you know them personally or something like that so I, I, when i've been watching them and listening to the shows when i haven't been on i've been thinking man i really don't like these guys but i want to like them because i know you like them <laughs> and and watching them i think i've figured out what the problem is i love their offense i, I like what they do but they don't actually seem like tough guys they just i don't know if it's their their costumes that they wear whether it's the promo skills, but they don't look like genuine. If you saw them in a bar, you wouldn't be intimidated by them. Whereas I think you would with any of the other guys on the roster, bar maybe Grado. Um, so can you see what I'm coming from? I, 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 I thought the match was excellent, but I don't know. I'm just not sold on them as the best team in the division or the hardest guys in the division uh, at, at this moment. And I think that's more to do, as you say, with promos, their look at the moment and, and maybe even the way that even simple things like their ring entrance and things like that. I like the masks, but I don't know. I'm just, I'm just not sold on them. And I think like Rose said, I don't think it's going to be a long reign. I think that, that they'll be in the mix for a long time, but I think there'll be a bigger, badder team coming along. Hopefully they will be soon. Yeah. OVE is, um, well, I don't know them personally. I, I know someone who knows them personally. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, as a, a, a female that she's a local uh, ring announcer and backstage correspondent for a indie uh, promotion that I go to. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm gonna go on a limb here and say that um, LAX recaptures the titles in this set of tapings. Whether it is, uh, I don't even know if it'll be in this set of tapings necessarily. I could see them uh, wrestling and crash again or something like that and uh, regaining the titles. I just, uh, this was too, too out of left field. I, I don't see the uh, us going through the next four episodes up to Bound for Glory with uh, OVE with the titles. That just, um, I don't know, D doesn't feel right to me at this point. I, I'm, I'm going to go on a limb and say they, they recapture them in this set of tapings. Just to jump across that, I remember when the American Wolves or Wolves um, won the titles. I think it was in Japan, wasn't it? I think there was a lot of criticism that they won their first titles at a house show. Uh, but I can absolutely see the way that 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 LAX has been presented and and all these connections they now got. I can absolutely see them regaining the titles down in Tijuana or something like that. And I think it would be good. I don't think it will come in for the criticism that the Wolves got when they won it. I don't, I don't I, yeah I, I just got to go with my gut there I really think they're gonna get him back you got anything further on this row yeah um I would think if they do get him back wouldn't it make more sense to get him you know challenge in some sort of match 
uh, at a Bound for Glory versus at the tapings. I mean, at least that way you give OV's run. I mean, I don't know if they have any uh, new tag teams coming in. Um, these uh, the rest the remaining set of these tapings, or um, but anyways, you know, you give OV you know some time you know to work with some different teams. But yeah, if, uh, I'm all for and I I'm a believer that uh, LAX will regain the titles. But I would like I would of the mindset more so at Bound for Glory versus the tapings, but uh, we'll see. We get a segment next with Lashley and American Top Team. Um, you know, I'm, I was glad this was kind of quick. You know, there was about four episodes in a row where they it almost felt like they were dominating the show because they had several segments, and uh, it was very quick and over, and I was happy about that. Um, I, I really, because I really thought I was going to get into something uh, a lot bigger than I, I really was interested in. So main event time, it was uh, the world title, uh, Eli Drake versus Johnny Impact. I was I, I was corrected. I had said this was going to be his first title defense, but I forgot he um, he did defend against Matt Seidel, and then uh, he defended it in um, in uh, AAA as well. Uh, he defended it last week. So great to see uh, Eli Drake with this title, and um, looks like he's really running with it. And they did a great job with this match. I thought it was a, a really solid main event. I didn't expect Johnny Impact to win it every, at any point because I, I really think uh, Eli Drake is just going to have this title for a really long time. And as competitive as it was, you know, the again, when Adonis gets tossed out, which was really what happened to Caleb Conley earlier, and then Adonis came back, you know, after after the ref bump, which you know they've been talking about the ref bump forever with TNA, you know, uh, overusing that, and then uh, hitting him with the title, which was what the same thing that Trevor Lee did earlier in the match. I actually found the the finish of the match to be pretty good as far as uh, Impact jumping off the top ropes and getting a uh, a kick to the nuts and then hit with the gravy train and the match is over. I liked that. I just didn't think. I think they could have done that same finish without all the other shenanigans, uh, you know, and with Eli Drake, you know, let's, let's run with this dude. Let's, you know, he doesn't have, so far he's, uh, you know, both his title matches on impact have had a chair, uh, keep calling it chair shot, a, a title shot to the head and, um, dirty finishes. And it, it's okay to not have to cheat every time. It's that's how Eddie Edwards was when he had the title. He wasn't cheating, but he, there was always some kind of interference or something, um, for him to get the win. So I really hope that we can see Eli Drake just just run through people. Uh, what you, what do you got the, on this one, Ro? Um, yeah, it was great. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing. Like, okay, you know, that seemed, seemed to be the theme of the show for the Hills. Like, you know, there, we're Hills. We have to win <laughs> in, in, in a dirty fashion. But, yeah, in order for Drake's, uh, title reign to be successful he's gonna have to have you know some matches where he just runs through opponents like the uh, you know Adonis being there doesn't you know play a factor and stuff because you can only go to the well with that so so often you know and we've we seen it even when with uh, like you were speaking about with uh, Eddie Edwards when he was champion he was faced you know you can only do so much of that you know win by the skin of your teeth Cause then you know people stop believing you, uh, you know, as champion and stuff. So yeah, moving forward, what they'll have to do with Drake is, you know, give him some um, convincing the title wins like they did up in uh, Mexico. Absolutely, um, Adam. Do you got anything on this? I know that uh, you didn't actually get to catch the main event. Um, I know I know you read the results and everything. Uh, do you, Do you got anything uh, to add to it? Yeah. Well, I mean. I said before, a huge Drake fan, and I think it's absolutely the result, right result. I'm with uh, Roe on this one in that uh, I, I, I just hope that it's not Adonis interfering every week because I, I think that um, sorry, Eli has to, at some point, establish himself as someone who can do it on his own as well. And uh, Hopefully they won't, they won't keep going to that same well that, that we talk about each time. But uh, yeah, Johnny Impact will come again. I think it was the right decision not to put, you know, to fast track the belt onto him. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward if, uh, you know, Patron comes back, where he fits in. Uh, would he f start feuding with with Johnny Impact? Who's next up? You know, it's good to see the post-match stuff. Who's getting involved in the title as well? You know, that's another nice little twist coming into it as well. So, yeah, I I'm glad Eli Drake won. 
I thought the timing, I saw the, the, the finish, actually. I have seen the finish. I thought the timing of the kicks of the nuts was, was spectacular. I think uh, <laughs> I, could, I could watch that over <laughs> and over. Uh, so, yeah, I like the finish. But uh, as you say, yeah, booking, I think, has been generally very good across the show in the respect that heels are being booked like heels. It's just a shame there wasn't more variation within each show as to how they do it, you know, such as the title belt thing. Uh, you know, if that was once a week, they did that with different people, fine. But it just so happened they all happened on the same show this week. So after the match, there's a, a big clusterfuck. And, and uh, I mean, it was interesting at the same time, but it was extremely random. So, you know, Drake and Adonis are doing the beat down on Johnny Impact, which, you know, right there lets us know, okay, they're going to move forward with this storyline. This isn't like he beat Matt Seidel and moved on to someone else like you know, the fact that they're attacking him after the match kind of lets us know this is going to be the feud going forward. Um, so we hear music hit. I have no clue who it is. And it runs down and it's Garza Jr. Out of all people, you know, he, he recently had this match with Braxton Sutter. Where I actually thought they were going to have a little angle going. Um, and whatever do, they're doing with Braxton and Ali has been very, very slow. Um, you know, we barely get it. So we don't really know what they're doing every week with it. But... Um, Garza Jr. runs down, out of all people, someone who hasn't been associated with the main event in any way whatsoever, and someone that I think deserves a singles push, but I, I am enjoying him with Laredo Kid right now, and I don't think they should be splitting them up at the moment. Um, and then LAX comes down, and it's kind of a cluster, as I said. Conan uh, you know, straight arms a fan, and uh, then security comes down, and... Um, the master lock has been put on the referee. Drake tosses the other referee around. And it, it reminded me a little bit too much of the, um, man, the, the thing with Americans top team where they kept attacking the referees and the officials and, and, you know, backstage officials and all that. Like it was almost like that's what this was again. So that's, that's kind of the part I didn't care for. I was laughing when Drake tossed the referee out of the ring. I know row plays, uh, 2k and everything that wwe video game um you know when like when you grab a referee and toss him out of the ring you know uh that's yeah. exactly what that looked like as far as the way he just flailed over the top rope um so i i found that hilarious but uh i don't know if uh adam caught this or not or just read about it but what do you got row on this um this melee at the end of the show I didn't like it because it just seems like what, you know, we've been talking about with this company. One of the kind of um, sour, sour, sour notes with the company is, you know, when they just kind of just throw stuff out there. Like, you have Garza running down. I'm guessing that they're trying to, you know, tell us fans that maybe Garza is going to be in the mix. You know, whether it's, you know, next in line for a title shot or maybe, you know, he has aspirations of challenging for the global a uh, world title, but then what's LAX coming down for? You know what? You know what issues do they have with Garza? I just, you know, when you have these rundowns or you know these saves, I like to see some kind of association with the parties involved. And it just came off completely random. Like I'm just watching. It's like, what's the point of Garza coming out? You know, outside of yeah, he's a face. I guess faces stick together. But what's LAX's beef with Garza? It would have made more sense if Braxton came out maybe and attack guards and then at least we know like hey you know they had uh you know some you know issues you know a couple uh, episodes ago so it was just complete random you know but i'll take this over the whole you know america's top team beating up all the refs and stuff because i mean when they're they've reached karen jarrett levels on when i see them i just thought like oh god <laughs> start shutting out yeah um yeah yeah this whole thing I, I just didn't get it um i'm not gonna say i necessarily disliked it but i didn't really like it um, I'm trying to give it a chance and see what what they do with it next week. And, I mean, I was trying to do the math. The numbers don't even add up. So it's not like um, you can have LAX and Drake and um, uh, Adonis on one team and have Impact and Garza Jr. on the other. I mean, there, and there's, I mean, there's no two other baby faces. So if they were trying to – if they're trying to do some bigger match for later, it's going to be even more random because they got to, you know, figure out a couple random guys to throw in there. But – um, th this is what's funny about it being a smaller company because if this was WWE and there was a, uh, a brawl at the end and some random mid-carder came down, 
all the podcasters and YouTubers and dirt sheets. Be, oh my gosh, what? Wait, why? Why was he included with this? You know, like, uh, you know, it'd be headlines, and then like it happens on Impact, and we take it more as like, the fuck is this? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, they, 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 um, I remember when I used to follow, and I want to say this is when, uh, Owens had debuted. And, you know, when they have those break apart brawls, usually, you know, amongst main eventers, the people who break, you know, come out is usually the lower card guys or, you know, low mid card guys. But Kevin Owens was part of, you know, the group trying to break up, you know, I forgot who was shooting at the time. And oh my God, man, it was just like. <laughs> Folks went into cardiac arrest, <laughs> and it's like, oh my god, Kevin Owens is part of that. What are they doing? You know, like, and you know, like you said, you know, we look at this, we're just looking at more of like, okay, what's he doing out here? You know, and look, if they're gonna give Garza an opportunity to, you know, mix it up with main eventers, hey, have at it. I mean, I I'm not opposed to him, you know, being a singles wrestler, but you know, we always are talking about we need more tag teams. Why not have him and Laredo Kid, you know, challenging for, you know, the the um, tag team titles you know we need tag teams so but hey you know it, it, it's no big deal to us impact fans yeah i think maybe they feel like ove is a team they can really run with for the baby faces you know and then there's also reno scum coming back who is who's probably going to get a push when they come back and there's of course the veterans of war and uh, a fun a funny thing about veterans of war and i'm gonna get to adam here in a little bit was that um i was watching one it was one night only like maybe like three four months ago and vow wrestled uh falaba and mario bokara and pretty decent match because you know usually on one night only it's a little more competitive and after the match uh mayweather was like that was the hardest battle we've had since afghanistan I'm like what the hell are you talking about <laughs> 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 oh my god I, I just dude that was so so funny but my jaw just dropped when he said that it was like the the most jobbingest tag team that the company has but um <clears throat> that's so, crazy <laughs> i was just gonna say just while you're mentioning uh funny things that have happened on impact that there's one that i'm shocked that neither of you mentioned over the last two three weeks the only reason i say two three weeks is because they re you know how impact have got this habit of repeating a lot of stuff from the week before uh, that there was one segment which both times they showed it, I was in stitches, and it was where Congo Con just put his fist out and uh, Richard Justice just ran into oh. it. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Okay. That was cool. <laughs> I was in stitches. I was in absolute stitches both weeks. <laughs> he just, it just so matter. He didn't throw a punch. He just held his fist out and he ran into I told, it. I, but anyway, we got, we get off. No, I, I totally <laughs> forgot about that. That's hilarious. I, I, I'm kind of curious. I know we're off topic here. What the hell they're doing with Congo Kong? Because remember he had a, remember he attacked Eddie Edwards backstage, out of like rage, and, and they never revisited it that in any way. What he did it because he was mad that Grado was trying to hook up with a uh, Laurel, and he like went into some kind of rage backstage. But then they they never, you know, you would think okay, this big guy just attacked me. Like I want to match with him next week, and that didn't happen at all. We. We uh we actually didn't talk about the segment with Grado and uh, Joseph Park, which I haven't like totally been enjoying the, their segments for the most part. But I actually thought this one was kind of funny today, where he gives him the royalty check and and he says, um, you know, acting like it's some big check, and Grado's like, "Oh, dinner's on me." I thought it would have been a lot funnier if if Joseph Park didn't get up and leave, like almost like, "Oh, dinner's on you, awesome," and and it you know. They uh, kind of fade out to them being oh full and all this all these empty plates and then Grado gets the bill and then looks at his royalty check and realizes he can't cover the cost. I thought that would have been a lot funnier than the way they did it. But uh... I have a feeling that that a lot of these segments that they're doing and it's the same with the, the originally the Team America things. I, I think they're playing on the dirt sheets at this point because there's obviously this talk about the contracts that you know the impact roster had to sign but they're giving away royalties to their management company and i'm sure this is just uh, you know sticking the middle finger up to to uh Meltzer and co by, by doing segments like this that's all, i'm sure that's all this is you got anything on that one ro um you know to piggyback off of what uh, adam's saying i you know i was thinking the same thing too but you know, BQ, you and I had, you know, both discussed this. The one thing that Impact has to be careful doing, because I feel like, you know, at least me, I feel like they do at times is, 
I think they worry too much with the dirt sheet say and like they'll try to book their show like because even you know stemming back to oh well how's Grado going to marry LVN you know if she's Canadian and stuff and then they automatically change change it I mean you know would you guys really had a problem had he married her you know knowing the fact that she's Canadian I mean it, it wasn't a big deal to me but um mm. I, I think though the the end game for this I could see uh, Grado um, or maybe uh, Park, one of these guys turning heel and uh, feuding with one another. It just, I don't know. I, I feel like the ingredients are there. Maybe it's just me, though. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's a possibility. I just, it's one of the storylines you, I think you guys both make good points, but I, I don't know where they're going with it. And I thought, I thought Laurel was going to factor back into it after kind of having a nervous breakdown. Um, but we've been talking about Laurel and her character progressing. And last week on Impact, she was in the crowd. And instead of wearing the dirty dress, she was dressed nice. But her hair and makeup was messed up. So uh, I have to wonder if there uh, there's some progression going on there. But I would have been... Um, if, if they keep going back to Laurel kind of having nerves, you know, these breakdowns and going back to that, that character, I think that's actually long term you know if she's with the company for a while i think that's actually pretty good but i I wouldn't mind seeing her um normal right now factored into this knockouts view that's going on i mean i I think um you know if she was in the mix there i think it would be pretty enjoyable but uh yeah i don't know what's going on i just think it's it's a bit overstacked at the moment already i mean the champion is struggling to get airtime. i I just think that if I was her and they offered me that, I would say, no, it's okay. I'll carry on doing what I'm doing for the time being. And the same you mentioned with Diamante earlier on. I just think that, uh, that you know, they'd get lost in the mix at the moment. There's, there's too many for too little time at the moment. And I just think that if they could get a different storyline connected to maybe the male roster so they do get extra time, the better for, for Laurel and also for Diamante. Yeah, you know, I forgot about Diamante. Uh, Ro and I were talking... A while ago, uh, when we were doing our preview for this show, that you know, there's the top six knockouts that were in the match, and even and there's even a top seven if you would factor Laurel in. And I actually forgot about Diamante. You know, she she could be number eight and all that, but the uh, the knockouts is really um, heel heavy right now, which is funny because when the new regime took o- took over, Sienna was like the only heel, um, and, and then Laurel, of course. But, uh, you know, she wasn't being taken seriously like that at the time. So she was the only heel in the division um, because Rosemary was a tweener at the time. And now it's it's kind of funny because now it's very heel heavy and we're going to lose Gail Kim at the end of the year. So, you know, obviously there's a, a couple knockouts coming in and there's a, a rumor about Tessa Blanchard who, uh, if people are not familiar with her, she can actually slide into that Gail Kim role very easily, I think. Um, she's not going to be Gail Kim, obviously, but uh, she's she's just really one of the best independent workers out there. So um, I think that the knockouts do need to add uh, a little more star power to the baby faces because once Gail Kim's gone, I don't think Rosemary and, and Allie can hold it down by themselves. Obviously, we don't even know if MJ is going to be around with these cu- cuts. You know, hopefully she is. She hasn't had a chance. But her and Alicia and Ava, you know, are, are obviously not positioned to be in the title picture so Excellent. I've got one more thing BQ if you don't mind there's a question for both you and Ro uh, it's just about the Grand Championship obviously I was part of the EC3 conference call last week and uh, you know it wasn't featured at all on this show and as I said earlier on in this show um, that I can't if he's going to be in a triple A match what's going to happen to the championship are they going to go with it he didn't seem really sold on the idea that it was going to stay in the same format. So, so what do you guys think about this? Um, you know, I, I am a believer that they just need to just do away with the rules and just make it their mid card title. But with this company's history and, uh, mid card titles, they haven't really been invested. I mean, this stems back from when they had the TV title and, you know, TV title went through so many different names before then, even, uh, I want to say what last year when they had the King of the Mountain uh, Championship, with exception to Eli Drake, everyone who held that belt, it always took a back seat. So you got EC3 holding it. EC3's you know one of the top guys in the company. So him holding it, you know, legitimizes that 
that title, but I think it's the rules that do it a disservice. And for him to hold it, that title and not be defending it, you know, especially at the big show Bound for Glory, it just makes the title seem like a prop, like he had stated in uh, in the teleconference. So, um, you know, I hope they do away with the rules and treat it like, you know, the company's version of an intercontinental title. I hope so, too. Um, I don't know if with the, the title grand that it could work as a regular title because I think um, Billy Corgan was saying he kind of named it after, um, you know, a format in Japan. And that's where the uh, grand came from. Um, so I don't know. He, you know, EC3 did say that he feels like that belt is a prop. You know, he doesn't say, he doesn't sound legitimately very proud of it. He said the title's beautiful, which it is. And um, yeah, I, I've I guess I'm in the minority that the rules have never bothered me, but the fact that it, it just doesn't feel like anything. You know, in the early days when Aaron Rex had it. Um, I don't think he was a good champion, don't get me wrong, but what I liked about it was that anybody could get a shot, you know, like it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily feud based, you know, um, he might wrestle Trevor Lee one week, he might wrestle Baron Dax the next, um, might wrestle Jesse Goddard the next, and you know, it was just kind of like, um, it was just kind of a title that felt like it was okay for anyone to just kind of step up and challenge, and um, uh, but, but now it's kind of like, it just it doesn't feel important at all. Um, I would be more okay with it if there was an additional mid card title, but then you're you're kind of con- convoluting the uh, title scene. Yeah, if I could add one thing, you know, the thing, and I, the, the, with the rules, I kind of felt like maybe if they were to save them, like say, you know, you're having a blow off uh, feud and you were to implement the rules in that particular match, fine. But the, the thing, what I hate about the rules is, you it's always in it could only be a one-on-one match so just say if you wanted to do maybe a three a triple threat match where you have ec3 defending the the grand championship against james storm and phantasma you can't do it under the grand uh championship rules so that's why i've just been of the mindset just do away with it treat it like a mid card you've gone this far with it if you scrap it and bring something else you're just taking you know steps backward like they've already invested just tweak the rules a little bit and just make it be you know your mid card that that championship that people you know tend to challenge for before they get the opportunity to challenge for the world championship i saw someone mention um on twitter or youtube and uh the way they worded it i I thought maybe ec3 had said this on this on the conference call but i didn't hear him say it but they they said the rules um, would be more interesting if it was a two out of three falls match. Yeah, that that that, that would be yeah. Fine. Instead of round, you know, if they want yeah. to put some kind of stipulation on the title. Uh, yeah, I can yeah. See that. I, I do like uh, the idea of it being like the uh, the old is it the old TV title where it's defended each week on TV. I quite like the idea of a fighting champ, and you know, f- from a, a wrestler's point of view, it means they're on TV each week as well. And it also allows talent to come into the company and make an instant impact, a good way of introducing characters in who you might not have seen before for shock value, you know. Uh, so I think a belt like that would work. But, yeah, the rounds, that does hold it back, doesn't it? So uh, I think that's going to do it for us today with the um, Impact Review Victory Row 2017 is in the books um, for the second time this year because that's what the Knockouts Knockdown One Night Only show was called. But um, so Victory Road number two in the books, pretty good show, pretty solid. Uh, they're building up a few things that you know we don't really know where they're going with it, but you know let, let's give it a chance and see, um, s- see what happens. You know, um, I still think last year's Slammiversary had the best, um, the best build for, for pay per view in a while. I thought last year's Bound for Glory was 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 pretty decent too. Uh, this year's Slammiversary build was not my favorite. And I think I think they're doing a decent job with this one, but more because um, I just don't know. We don't know where the hell they're going with some of the angles, but um, you know, we'll see. So, uh, for Adam and Roe, this is BQ. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll talk to you guys again next week. Peace.